Well, hello. Welcome to um, session four of ACMISBC beginner track uh, graphs, so on graph traversals. Um, yes, so before we get started, here is the portal code. Let me just, sorry, my computer's freezing up. There we go. Here's the portal code. Uh, enter it, win some points. Alrighty. And it's an announcement we have office hours every Monday from six to seven. Um, you can come and ask questions. You can come and just hang out. Maybe you'll see Alvin speed running Minecraft, uh, or you can get some useful ACMISPC advice. Either way, it'd be a great time if you can. So with that, let's get started. Alrighty, so uh, here we go. So today we're gonna switch it up a bit. Um, this is beginner's track, so there's a lot of different, I mean, maybe not today as much, but there's a lot of different like, uh, uh, difficulty levels, people have are at different places. And so maybe you may have heard of graphs and like know a lot about them, maybe you don't. But either way, we're gonna start with a graph problem, no coding required, that can help you know like how we use graphs in problem solving and get your toes wet in doing that. So let's start. Awesome, so congratulations due to your Weeks of dedication in your highly trained algorithmic minds, you've been recruited to the very real, very prestigious secret branch of ICPC known as SpyCPC. For your first mission, there's a bad man named Devil Man Dan who runs a gang based out of Japan. He has only one weakness. He's watched My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, and thus he knows the essential truth that friendship is magic. And as such, you will always pick up the phone for a friend, or in our case, a friend of a friend, uh, what have you. And so your goal is to use your mutual contacts to reach him. And as soon as he picks up the phone, the higher ups at SpiceBC can try and give it his location. They can send in the drones, arrest him, et cetera. It's so great. He needs to call him, but it's not like you just have his phone number. How do you get it? Well, you can get a phone number that you don't have by calling someone whose phone number that you do have and asking for it. So for example, if you uh, wanted Lenny's number, but you had my number, uh, you could just call me, say, can you give me Lenny's number? I'll say, hey, sure, then do that. Easy peasy, you have her number. But uh, Spice PC has one more constraint. They don't want uh, to raise any suspicions. So they want you to do this by calling as few people as possible. There you go. So just to recap, your objective is to find a series of calls that will give you Devil Man Dan's number that contains as few people as possible. And their input to help you out, Spice PC will give you a list of all known contacts of Devil Man Dan. So cool, let's say you're given this list of connections. Uh, Devil Man Dan is friends with Alvin, Bill, and Lenny. Uh, Alvin's friends with Bill, Emma, Farah, Giovanni, Devil Man Dan, et cetera, et cetera. You're friends with Rohit and Rishi. Uh, so the, great, this list is great, but it can also be difficult to like see the connections on here. Uh, we wanna know the least amount of people that you can contact in order, that you need to contact in order to get to Devil Man Dan. Um, and if we really read this, we can see that Farah, for example, uh, is two phone calls away from Devil Man Dan. Farrah calls Alvin, Alvin calls Devil Man Dan. Great, but this isn't obvious. I'm represented this way as a list. There isn't any immediate way to see how many connections are between any two contacts. And so we want a way to represent this data that makes it more intuitive, more visual. So how about we just draw it out? So if we do this, uh, we see with our list, we have Devil Man Dan in red over here. Right over here, great. And so we know that he's friends with Alvin, Bill, and Lenny. So we could just fill that in. And we know Alvin, we know Alvin is friends with Emma, uh, Bill, Giovanni, and Farah. So we can just add those in. And if we knew the rest of the list, we could just fill it in like this. Perfect. So now we have this structure that makes it a lot easier to see how close any two people are. And it's pretty easy to read too. Uh, we can see that the, there we go, these circles here, these are just uh, people and these lines represent phone calls. So for Emma, for example, we can clearly see that the least amount of phone calls she needs to make is two. She needs to call Alvin who calls Dan. Great. Um, we can see that this also, no, this isn't the only way for Emma to reach Dan. She could call Al Alvin who calls Bill who calls Dan, but that would take three calls. So why would she do that? Um, great. So when looking at you all the way over here, you can still see it's not, like obvious what the least amount of phone calls you need to make is, we can see that the least amount of phone calls you need to make to find that, we just need to find the shortest path between you 
And then we'll define the path here as the amount of phone calls that you need to make. Um, great. Oh, interrupt me, by the way, if you have any questions or something's not clear, please. Awesome. Okay, great. So you've now successfully turned our original problem into this new problem. But the question is, how do we solve this new problem um, of finding the shortest path? Well, uh, we could, I mean, it seems easy. You could just try every path, except we can see that that will probably take a long time. And as ACMISBC BC algorithmic spies, uh, efficiency is integral to your work. So the question, finally, that I'm going to posit to you is, is there a way to find the shortest path between uh, two people um, that doesn't require going through every path in this structure? And a good place to start is how many phone calls do you need to make uh, in between um, Alvin and Dan? So Alvin can reach Dan, as you can see, in one phone call. And how can we use that information to see the shortest path between uh, Alvin, any of Alvin's friends and them. So great. With that, I'll give you uh, a few minutes to just ponder it on your own. Also, uh, you can feel free to ask questions. So if, I don't know if the recording will be paused or not, but either way, yeah. Just. Maybe um, until six Another minute. Let it percolate. Thank you. Awesome. Well, 613. Hopefully you've had a chance to think about it. Thank you. Um, cool. So does anyone want to share any observations they made from that? Any at all? It's fine if you don't. Cool, cool, cool. No worries. Um, so the shortest path from Alvin to Dan, as you can see, is one. And we know for sure that the shortest path from Alvin to Dan is one, right? And so the crucial observation is, since we know this for sure, um, if we want to find the shortest path from Emma to Alvin, for example, from Emma to Dan, sorry, then we know the shortest path from Emma to Alvin is also just one, because there is no shorter path than one. And so the uh, shortest path from Emma to Dan must be uh, Emma, um, Emma to Alvin plus Alvin to Dan, which is one plus one, which is two. And so here we go. We could just start from Alvin, Bill and Lenny and say, well, for sure, we know that the shortest path here is going to be one. And we can just continue like that outwards until we have the shortest path from you to Dan. The shortest path, here you go, from Emma to Alvin uh, is one, Alvin to Dan, we continue, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Fantastic, so now you can see that the shortest path right here from you to Dan is seven phone calls. 
that's optimal. Great job. Alrighty. Uh, so as it turns out, this whole thing, this picture structure here that we made, it's a more general paradigm of problem solving that you probably already guessed, given why we're here today. It's called a graph. Um, what we wanted to do with this problem was show you how naturally graphs can arise in a ton of different situations, um, how you can go about problem solving with them. And uh, even before we go over all the definitions and algorithms, which we will get to in a second. Uh, so what you actually saw here, I just put the seed in there, is a uh, BFS, we use this thing called breadth for search, which uh, will help us get to, which we use that to find the shortest path. You don't know what that means yet. That's completely expected and we will go over it in, in a little bit. All right, so with this example under our belts, we can dive in to what is a graph? Awesome. So a graph in graph theory, a graph is a set of vertices and edges representing, whoa, sorry, all my lights just turned off. One sec. Okay, there we go. Great. Uh, in graph theory, a graph is a set of vertices and edges representing relationships between objects. So you can see here we have a oh, vertex and the vertex and they're connected by an edge. A vertex may also be called a node. You'll hear that often. Uh, they're used interchangeably. To be consistent, I'll try and always use the term vertex here, but you can use whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with already. So formally, so this is the uh, definition you might see in like Math 61, CS 180, whatever. Uh, if we let G be the graph, and V be the set of vertices on G, and E be the set of uh, edges on G, we denote a graph thusly. Uh, G is equal to V E. So for example, we can see uh, this graph right, he right here, uh, where we have vertices one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four, and then we have the edges right here, one, two, you see you have an edge between one and two right here, one and three, et cetera. So in competitive programming, you will generally be given a graph in terms of its edges. So these things right here, All right? So for example, when you're given a graph, the input data will often look something like this, or always look like this. Like it can take the form of grids or in tricky problems, just kind of whatever. Um, they might have, you might have to take different data and then make your own graph inside of it. I don't know, cool stuff. But for a lot of the problems we'll see here today, for example, it'll probably look something like this. All right, so here's some like real world examples of graphs. We have a friendship graph where the vertices represent people and the like relationship here is uh, an edge, uh, is friendship and a neighborhood graph where the vertices represent landmarks and the edges represent the roads between them. All right, and so here's some terminology so that we can meaningfully talk about graphs. Um, adjacent vertices are vertices that are connected by an edge. So these two vertices are adjacent, for example, and the degree of a vertex is how many edges it has. So the degree of this vertex down here would be three because it has one, two, three edges on it, and the degree of this would be one. Awesome. And last thing you're gonna wanna know about a path, we did just talk about this in our first uh, example problem, uh, but we're just gonna formalize it here. So a path from some vertex A to some vertex B, is a collection of vertices, A, C1, C2, I don't know, it would be such that all of these are edges. So effectively, it's exactly what you would think that a path is. Um, similarly, a cycle, also called a circuit sometimes, you might hear that, uh, is a special case of a path where A is equal to B. So it starts and ends at the same vertex. So it's probably exactly what you'd think of when you think of a cycle. Uh, all right. Some other examples, uh, also grids are a special cases of graphs. So this is why you might see grids in graph problems. You can see here how you could turn a grid into a graph like this. So yeah, the same algorithms and stuff that we're gonna use uh, today for graphs, you can also use on problems represented using grids, which is really awesome. And a whole nother class of problems we're gonna learn to solve. Uh, great. But now when you're modeling real world problems, you might notice that sometimes not all relationships look like this. They're not two-sided like this. Like Valentine's Day is coming up, for example. What if you had a, you have a crush on somebody and they've made it clear to you that they do not have a crush on you? This is a relationship, but it's a one-way relationship. You have a relationship to them that they do not have back to you. Can graphs represent this? Yes, they absolutely, yes, they can. A set of vertices, a sorry, a directly graph is a set of vertices and edges where the edges have an arrow on them indicating direction. So you can see here, this little arrow that indicates direction. So this vertex is a relationship to this one, and this one does not have back to this one. 
All right, and there's a little bit different terminology uh, used to describe these. Uh, so the in degree, so whereas in uh, undirected graphs, we have degree. In directed graphs, we have in degree and out degree, where in degree is how many edges are pointing to a given vertex and out degree is how many edges are pointing away from a given vertex. So you can see this example right here, where four, for example, uh, the in degree is one and the out degree is two. Fantastic. And uh, whereas with undirected graphs, we have um, adjacency or also called neighbors, though I didn't mention that, but here uh, we just have in neighbors and out neighbors. So in neighbors are vertices that have an edge to the vertex and out neighbors are vertices that have an edge from the vertex. Fantastic. So uh, in modeling real world problems, there's still something that we haven't considered, right? So let's imagine, just for the sake of this, that you're a novice Instagram travel blogger. You obviously need to look uh, to book expensive trips around the world, it's part of the job, but it's not like you just have the money to be spending it really nearly, you just started. So you have a bunch of cities that you wanna visit, say Milan, Paris, Shanghai, uh, you wanna visit your grandma in Oklahoma, sure. Um, you wanna find the cheapest way to do this. And this isn't just a shortest path problem, there's another variable here, Hold the variable you wanna account for, um, how much the trips cost. Um, so each trip has a value, the cost of that flight, and it's an integral part of the problem. So how are you gonna find the cheapest collection of flights if you can't see how much the flights cost? Well, easy solution, just put the values onto the graph. There you go. Now, this is an entirely new type of graph known as a weighted graph. Uh, in a weighted graph, each edge is assigned a weight. And also, here it's shown undirected, that they can be directed or undirected. All right. Oh, also something I should mention about uh, directed graphs uh, versus undirected graphs. If no one says that it, the graph is directed, you can just assume that it's undirected. If it's directed, it'll be specified. So don't worry. Um, fantastic. So now that we've learned in the past like five or 10 minutes, all of these new like graph, all this new graph terminology and stuff, that's great, but we wanna code it up. We wanna actually use these graphs in our solutions how can we do that? Well, we have to implement them. There are a few ways to do this. All right, so the most common ones are an adjacency list and an adjacency matrix. Let's look right here. So an adjacency list uh, looks like this. In, you know, we could draw it out like this. This is what it looks like in theory. Obviously in code, it doesn't look like this. Uh, the idea is that we have a vector where each entry refers to a vertex in the graph. So for each vertex, we store a vector of all its adjacent vertices. Uh, it might sound confusing, but let me show you an example really quick. So for this graph right here, it could be stored in an adjacency list this way. Sorry. All right, so you can see we have uh, vertices one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and um, one is connected to two, one's adjacent to two, so you put two in the adjacency list, one is also adjacent to three, so three is in the adjacency list, and two is adjacent to one, three, and four. So in twos, one, three, and four in there. And uh, note that it doesn't have to actually be in order. I just happened to put it this way, but you know, you'll put it in the order, whatever order it comes in. So fantastic. The pros of an adjacency list is that it's space efficient. We only store the vertices that are in this graph. The cons, however, is that you have to iterate through the whole vector right here to see if any two vertices are adjacent. So it's best for graphs that don't have a lot of edges because then you won't be iterating too long, taking up too much runtime. And so let's see how you can actually implement this right here. So we have um, this adjacency list sample code where you declare your adjacency list and then you can push in your uh, values. So we'll do it like this. So in one, you store two. And then to you store one. And just to note, with a um, undirected graph, this is what you should do. You should push it into both because you want to be able to check one and say it's one adjacent to two. Yes, it is. And you want to be able to check two and say it's two adjacent to one. Yes, it is. In a directed graph, of course, you don't have to worry about this. So awesome. And then if you want to check, for example, if one is adjacent to three, you go through one's adjacency list and you'd see it's adjacent to 
three using this loop. Um, yeah, you have to go through the whole thing. And then something else we should mention, weighted graphs. Uh, how would you store these? Weighted graphs are kind of a whole different thing because they require you to store a whole another variable, right? So you want to store both, both variables together, uh, the weight and the vertex. How do we do this? Well, luckily enough for us, there does happen to be a data structure that stores two different pieces of data together called a pair, right? So here we go. Here's some syntax for a pair. Uh, you can declare a pair of ints like this. You want to access and deal with the first element, just my pair dot first. Uh, the second element, my pair dot second, or whatever your pair's name is. And then to make a pair out of two objects, two uh, pieces of data, you would just use the make pair function. Um, also, here we're going to be wanting to use int, int, but you can actually make a pair out of anything, you know, string, bool, whatever you want to do. Alrighty. And so uh, here's some sample code for this. We have uh, the weight as the first um, piece of data in the pair and the vertex as the second. And so here, for example, uh, we want to say that one is adjacent to two with a weight of five. And so you can push that here. And this says one is adjacent to two with a weight of five. And that's going to deal with that. And then likewise for these. Um, and here, you can also do something cool. You could check if one is adjacent to three with a weight less than four. So you could also like check stuff about the weights. And you can see that, yes, one is adjacent to three with a weight less than four. Fantastic. So here is some stuff to help you remember some of the like uh, more tricky things dealing with the specific implementations for specific types of graphs. Um, awesome. You can contrast an adjacency list with an adjacency matrix. Right, so the idea here is that we create a matrix of vector vectors where an entry is a one if there's an edge between two vertices and a zero otherwise. And so, for example, the same graph we dealt with earlier, you can see that one, you have uh, vertices one, two, three, and four, right? One, two, three, and four. And if there's an edge between, say, like one and two, one and two, it's a one. There's no edge between three and four. So three and four, it's a zero. And that's how it works. Uh, the pros of this is that, unlike the adjacency list, it's really quick and easy to check if two vertices are adjacent. You just say, you know, one and two, is it a zero or is it a one? Uh, and that's constant time. The cons is that it uses a lot of unnecessary space in graphs without a lot of edges. So uh, see here we have one, two, three, four, five zeros, and only four ones. So we have four edges, and then five, we're taking up five spaces just to say that there aren't edges there. That's not too useful. Um, and so this is best used when in graphs where there are a lot of edges. Fantastic. And so here's some sample code for this. You just create your vector vectors, and then you could push these in. One's adjacent to two, two's adjacent to one. And say if it were undirected, again, you'd want to, um, if it were uh, undirected, you want to make sure to put one, two, and two, one. If it were directed, you could just say one and three. And so, um, and if you want to check if the adjacency matrix, if one's adjacent to three, then you could just check it and it will turn true in constant time, which is great, uh, as promised. Here. And so here's the implementation cheat sheet for this. The convention uh, for directed graphs is that you put it in the matrix if the row is going to the column. And so that can help you out. Just remember that. And so you'll know, you know which one to check. And then here, if you want to store it for a weighted graph, uh, you could just put the numbers instead of the, like the actual weight of the edge instead of like one or zero. And you could still keep zero or like negative one for uh, if there is no edge there. Fantastic. So this is a lot of information I know. Um, we're almost able to actually use these effectively in our solutions. We just need to figure out how we can like go about seeing the data because we, when we get it, we, we're just getting it as like data points. We want to be able to just like actually meaningfully make use of that. Okay, so given a graph, how do we actually get around it? So we want to check every vertex. We want to do it without like, you know, circling back around, getting caught in different places. Can we do that? Of course we can do that. There are two ways to do that, um, breadth first search or BFS and depth first search DFS. All right, so 
in breadth first search, or BFS, we start at some vertex and we explore all the adjacent vertices and then all their adjacent vertices in turn and so on. So when we're actually doing this, um, we're gonna see examples uh, in a second, but for one quick example, when we're actually doing this, it could look something like this. Oh, that's supposed to kind of go. All right. And so you can know this is exactly how we traversed the graph earlier when we we're trying to find double man down. In layers like that. Whereas for uh, depth first search for DFS, we start at some vertex and we explore as far as possible along some branch. And then we kind of jump back when we can't explore anymore. So contrast this to VFS, it'll look like this. We have four or five, and you see we can't explore anymore down here. So we jump back to the most recent place where there are unexplored verses and we get to six. Fantastic. So um, here we are. So we're gonna wanna go through this so we can figure out how exactly we're going to implement this. So how are we gonna do it ourselves so we know how to make tell the computer like what we want it to do? All right, so we're gonna start with the start vertex. Uh, here are the steps right here, doing the best by hand. So step one, we wanna record, record the unvisited adjacent vertices in the log on the right here. This is where we're gonna really wanna look during this example uh, so we can figure out the properties that we're gonna want in a data structure that's gonna facilitate this for us. Uh, so we're gonna pay special attention to this area right here. So let's start. So step one, what are the adjacent vertices of the start vertex? It's just five. So we are going to put five into our vertices to visit log right here. And then uh, now that we have it here, we know it's gonna be visited. So we can just say, great, we've seen it. We know that it's here. Um, and we're going to actually explore it soon. So fantastic, that's step one complete. Uh, and since five is being pointed to by our next arrow right here, uh, we can go to it. Fantastic. And note that since we're now exploring five, uh, we should just take it out of our log because we've already did that. And I'm just gonna cross it out right here. And that's perfect. So now we have a vertex that we are visiting and thus we are back to step one which is we're gonna to want to record the unvisited adjacent vertices. Uh, so which vertices right now are unvisited and adjacent to our current vertex five? I have this to see if you wanna just call it out. You don't have to, but if you want to. Well, I will do it. No worries. So the unvisited adjacent vertices are nine, two, and 10. You see right here. And so, great, we can put them into our log and uh, mark them as visited. Perfect. And so now we're gonna go on to step three, which is explore the next vertex. We can see that our next arrow is now pointing to two. So we're gonna go there. Fantastic. Uh, back to step one. We record the unvisited adjacent vertices, which are six and three. Fantastic. Record them and continue. And notice that uh, five is adjacent, of course, but it's already visited, so we don't want that in our log. This is because just to be super clear, our log is telling us which vertices uh, we want to visit. So we've already visited this vertex. We don't want it in our log. Okay. Uh, so we'll do this a few more times, just to be thorough and get a really good understanding of how VFS works and how we're gonna to wanna to model it. Uh, so step two, you're going to, uh, step three, we're gonna visit the next vertex, uh, which is 10, oh, which is nine, sorry. And so we visit nine. So step one, nine has no unvisited adjacent vertices. Uh, so we have nothing to record. So step two, uh, step three, we move to the next vertex, which is 10. Um, 10 has 14, so we, uh, put that in there. Then we go to the next vertex, which is three, four, seven, four. Fantastic. So hopefully you get the point by now of how exactly this is going. Um, if you've been keeping an eye on the vertices to visit uh, thing right here, the, how did we interact with it? 
Well, it wasn't that interesting, to be quite honest. Uh, what we did was, it was a very simple pattern. We'd put in three vertices, for example, two, nine, and three, and then we visited them in that order, two, nine, and three. Very easy. And so, right, we're gonna want a data structure that acts like this, a data structure that makes sure that the first thing that we put in is also the first thing that we take out. And like the last thing that we put in is the last thing that we take out. Um, we don't even need to access all of the other elements. We just need to do this simple thing. Does a data structure like this exist? Yes, it does. It's called a queue. And a queue syntax is like this. So here's how you would use a queue. Um, it is a whole data structure, but don't be intimidated because it's just, this is really all we need to know to interact with it meaningfully for um, EFS. So you'd have to hashtag include Q to use it, to use the functions and all that. Um, you can declare Q, Q int with the angle brackets that you might be used to uh, from using vectors. We'll call it my Q. Of course, you can call it whatever you want. Um, push puts a number into the Q. Here you put the number one into the Q. Uh, this front function returns whatever's at the front of the Q. Pop is what takes it off. And so this is kind of, syncretic, I suppose. Uh, just know that if you look at what's at the front, you don't necessarily take it off. And when you take off what's at the front, you can't necessarily see it. So check and then pop it off, just remember. And then um, empty, it returns true if the queue is empty and it's false otherwise. So here's some pseudocode for BFS. You create a queue, you mark the starting vertex as visited and you put it into queue. Uh, and then while queue is not empty, you'd remove the vertex at the front of it and put all of its unvisited neighbors into Q and mark them visited. This is just what we just did. And then you could put that into code, which is exactly that right here. And so here's some example code. You should do just that. This is the function. Fantastic. Okay, so that's VFS. Uh, now DFS is a little bit different. Um, so we're gonna want to also explore that, do it by hand so we can see what properties we want in data structure. Uh, that's gonna allow us to do DFS. So again, we're gonna start, it's gonna look pretty similar to BFS. Um, we have five with the unvisited adjacent vertex. So we put it in here, visit it, and then we go to five. Um, fantastic. And so suck. we see the unvisited adjacent vertices here are two, nine, and 10. And so, I don't know, so far, what we're doing matches DFS, so we could just continue for now. Um, great, so let's say we're at two. Uh, fantastic. So we have two here. The unvisited adjacent vertices are six and three. We put them in here. Now, sorry, my computer keeps sticking on me. My apologies. There we go. So let's say we visited nine next. We could do that, but that wouldn't look like DFS. That would look like BFS because in DFS, as we saw earlier, you wanna explore a single path as far as you can and then jump back only when you've reached um, its apex, I suppose. And if we jump to nine, that's not what it would look like. And so how can we do that? Well, we wanna continue along a path. And so we, the only paths we have right here, the only th ways that we can continue along that path is to go to the um, adjacent vertices of two. One of the adjacent vertices, well, the adjacent vertices are all the way at the end over here. So we're gonna want our next, our next arrow to point to them. It's fantastic. Let's just make that little augmentation and then we can continue. And so we go to three now. Um, we see that our adjacent vertices are seven and four. And so again, now where are we gonna wanna go? We're gonna wanna continue on our path and so we're going to want to jump to the adjacent vertices, which are right down here. And so hopefully you're seeing kind of the pattern that's coming up with this DFS data structure. So we jump to four and then is it all right, right? If we can, if we come back now that we don't have any adjacent vertices to four, any adjacent unvisited vertices, is it all right if we go back to seven, does this mimic the backtracking behavior that we wanna see with um, uh, DFS? Well, yes, it does, because this seven, as you'll see, is the most 
uh, recent unvisited adjacent vertex. So if we just always jump to the end of our list here, then it seems that it will always give us the correct vertex to go to next for DFS, which is the crucial observation here. So this is just continuing on a little bit so you can get the point. Okay, fantastic. So now we've seen this pattern. Um, Q is, my apologies. Cool, so we've seen this pattern. Uh, how, what can we learn about how we interacted with that data structure? Well, it has an interesting sort of thing. We have two, nine, and three here. And so let's say we put in uh, two and nine, two vertices. Uh, so we'd go through, we'd go to nine. And let's see here, we added some vertex three. We always wanna jump to the end and deal with that next. And so basically we just need a data structure that always deals with the most recently placed number in our log next. So the first thing in is the, or the last thing that we put in is the first thing that we want to take out. Um, is there a data structure that models this? Yes, absolutely there is. It's called a stack. It has very similar syntax to the queue. And again, this is all we really need to know to meaningfully interact with it if we want to do DFS in our uh, solutions. So I'll just go over this, some of that. Pretty quickly, uh, push, again, uh, you place something into the stack. Top tells you what would be at the top of the stack. Pop takes it off the stack, and empty will tell you whether or not the stack is empty. It's true, if it's empty, false, otherwise. Fantastic. And so um, with DFS, just because of the way that it is, uh, like the fact that we need to see the most recent thing that we just put in there next, that is easily facilitated also by recursion. So there is a, we could, and you could um, implement it iter iteratively, simply, my apologies. You could implement it iteratively, uh, similarly to how we implemented BFS, uh, except using a stack, or you could do it quicker, perhaps more painlessly with recursion right here. So, fantastic. And here's a little cheat sheet if you want to remember the differences between depth first search and breadth first search. If you just come back to this slide. All right, so that was kind of a lot. Um, I'm going to give you what is it? Sweet two. Okay, a two minute break, just to let that percolate, and then I'll come right back to actually meaningfully interacting with these uh, or using these in our problems to actually solve things, which is what we ultimately want to do. So I'll see you at 6.44. Thank you. OK, cool. Come back. Um, hopefully, it's been a sufficient break, those two minutes. So now, BFS and DFS algorithms. How can we actually use BFS, BFS and DFS to help us solve difficult problems? Well, we'll see right now. OK, shortest path. So in our problem from the start of this workshop, um, we had to find Duffelman and Dan, and we did that by finding the shortest path. If you think back to it, um, I said that we used BFS to find the shortest path. And so hopefully you've seen how that works. I'm just gonna really formalize it here. So what we did was we went through all the adjacent vertices and we gave every adjacent unvisited vertex a path length of the current path length plus one. So you can see here, we go through and say the shortest path from here to here must be one. And so since this one also must have the shortest path that must be one, the shortest path from this to this must be two, right? So we saw why that worked, which is great. And the implementation of this algorithm requires only a very simple augmentation of the BFS algorithm. So we just need um, a vector that keeps track of the shortest distance to a vertex from our original vertex. We can call that dist here. And so if you're currently at, vertex, at a vertex V and we're visiting the adjacent vertex U for the first time, we keep track of the distance. This, the distance of U is equal to the distance of V plus one. And so you just add that to your BFS algorithm. And then using that, you could track the shortest path from one vertex to every other vertex in the graph. Fantastic. Um, and now what if we wanna know not just how long the shortest path is, but what it is? That's another simple or reasonable extension of the problem. 
it requires only a single vector. We can call it here parent of n. So what you do is for each vertex that you visit, you also keep track of the vertex that you came from, the parent of the vertex. And so we could do this by just adding this little code right here. The parent of u is v. And so say, you know, we're visiting each vertex u from the vertex v. The parent of u of course, is v. So once the BFS has completed, we can use this array to backtrack and recreate the shortest path in a similar way to what we did um, weeks prior with uh, DP and going back through. So just a recap of this, you find the shortest path, it was find the shortest path using BFS, um, it works on undirected graphs and directed graphs. It doesn't work on weighted graphs because uh, they have a weight on them. There are cool other um, algorithms that work for that that we're not gonna explore today. But if you're interested, you should definitely talk to us about it afterwards or look it up because they're really cool. Um, but not necessary for the problems that we're gonna be working on today. Uh, and augmentations of this, is you can recreate the shortest path using the parent vector. So, fantastic. All right, uh, the next thing we're gonna do is also kind of simple and intuitive. You can use BFS or DFS to do this, actually. Okay, great. So, what if you've been given another villain to locate? A Machiavellian mic. So you draw out the graph the same way that you drew the one last time, and this time it looks like this. So you're here, Mike's over here. Can you ever reach him? No, of course you can't. There's no series of phone calls you can make that will ever get you to Mike. There's just no one here knows anyone that he knows. Um, and so this is a pretty intuitive idea of connectedness. Um, it's also very important. Uh, so a connected component is a subset of vertices and edges that there exists a path from each vertex to each other vertex. So you can see here, this vertex has a path to every vertex, um, but doesn't have a path to any of the vertices here. So, right. So if this is true for every vertex in a graph, the whole graph is called connected. So this graph here has two connected components and this graph is just connected. Um, this notion of connectedness, I should note, does not extend to directed graphs. There's a whole different thing for that because we, we have two kind of different relationships. And so uh, again, if you're curious about that, please talk about it uh, in, we can talk about it in office hours or after this. Right, so uh, I guess I'm just gonna ask you, how would you figure out whether your graph is connected or not, if you have any ideas? Because the way that you would do it, like just intuitively, is probably pretty close to the actual algorithm. You want to unmute or put it in the chat. We don't want to. And it's also okay. Hold on a second. Cool, cool, cool. I will continue, but I do hope you've thought about it. Oh, is there something in the chat? My apologies. Yes, yeah, sorry, I will repeat the question. The question is, um, knowing what a connected component is, you know, how would you figure out whether or not a graph is connected? Not even maybe in code, just like maybe if you're just kind of, or I guess if you have the edges given to you, how would you kind of go about figuring out whether or not this is connected. MBFS, yes, Julia, that is perfect. MBFS is exactly what you would do. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, so determining which components are connected, it's pretty intuitive. You simply run BFS or DFS to like hit the edge of your graph. So the idea, is that if your stack or your queue is empty, we still have vertices that are unvisited, then this must mean that those vertices are not adjacent to any of the ones that we have visited, because we saw in this algorithm, it requires that you go to all unvisited adjacent vertices. If they were adjacent, you would have visited them. So they must be part of a separate connected component. Um, and so what if you don't just want to know that connected components exist, but you want to know, and naturally essentially this problem is, you want to know 
uh, which vertices are in which different connected components and like how many there are. Well, you can keep track of them by replacing our visited vector that we use to see whether or not we visited something with a component ID vector. We say we visited it on which iteration of running BFS or DFS. So we give every vertex that we can reach with the same component ID. Uh, we give every vertex that we can reach the same component ID and then we increment it when we switch components. So we could do something like that. Awesome. So to recap this, uh, algorithm is you just use BFS or DFS, whatever you want to explore the graph. And if it ends, if your queue or stack is empty or the recursion comes back and there are still um, unvisited vertices, so just check your uh, vector, then you can repeat it on one of your unvisited vertices. Uh, this works on directed and weighted graphs, not um, undirected graphs for uh, reasons that I stated earlier. It's just kind of a different thing. Um, we could talk about it. Anyway, and so the augmentations you can make is you can determine which vertices are in a component by turning the visited vector into a component ID vector. Awesome. And finally, we have a more um, complicated, less intuitive kind of algorithm, I suppose, uh, where you use DFS. Fantastic. So recall that a cycle is a special case of a path where it starts and ends at the same vertex. Okay, awesome. So let's say that you are a biologist studying food chains. Um, well, a food chain is just a directed graph. So this might be a snapshot of one such graph that you like go to the ocean and just write stuff. I don't know anything about biology. Anyway, uh, so you can see here that we have a cycle where, like the octopus eats the mussels and the mussels eat the bacteria, whatever. Um, so a cycle in this graph represents a vulnerability. Um, if mussels suddenly died off, this would affect this whole section of the food chain. So I all just really like to know where cycles exist, what's in the cycles, um, so that they can understand the food chain better and better protect the um, environment. So this is just one example of a real world problem where detecting cycles is very important. Already. Oh, yes, if muscles die, so do octopi and uh, bacteria. All right, so how do we find a cycle? Um, let's try to build up this algorithm intuitively. So when we're looking for cycles, where do we start? Uh, well, we could start with the definition. A cycle is a path that starts and ends at the same vertex. So at some point when traversing our graph, we are gonna come across a vertex that we've already seen before. Um, but is that enough? Will we have found a cycle every time we come across a vertex that we've seen before? No, we won't. As we can see, you come across this twice, um, but there's no cycle there. Um, right, that's not strong enough. So, uh, we're gonna need to use a bit of tricky logic here uh, regarding DFS. So we know that DFS operates recursively. So you push the vertex onto the stack, then we leave it there and visit the vertices that it points to, right? And so then at some point later, we pops everything off above it and we'll finally return to um, that point in the stack. So we can kind of consider these two separate actions. We would visit a vertex when we push it onto the stack. And then later when we finish dealing with all the vertices below it, we're actually gonna explore it, right? Um, but what if things don't happen in this order? What if we visit a vertex before we popped it off the stack? So that would mean that there's some path to this vertex that the vertex is pointing to, and then that path also points right back to it. So you might notice, it's kind of confusing, but it's the definition of a cycle. It's a bit subtle. So like, I mean, I can go over it again or go over it um, more in depth after this, but this is the main idea behind the DFS cycle detection algorithm. So how we detect a cycle is uh, we'd run DFS with an additional vector that keeps track of what, our, what uh, vertices are currently on the stack. So when you come across a visited vertex, you can see if it's on the stack, and if it is, then you found a cycle. And so that's how you perform a cycle 
that's how you perform cycle detection. And if you uh, want to see what vertices are in the cycle, you could do the same thing that we did prior, which is we had a parent vector, and then you can just store the parent of each thing in there, and you can retrace your cycle. And this works. As you've seen, it works on directed graphs, it works on weighted graphs, it works on undirected graphs. It's great. KFS is great. So yes, here's a little cheat sheet for all the things that we just learned about BFS and DFS. And um, you can come back to the slide if you want to. And here's a meme. If this helps you understand computer science better. I don't know, help me. So yes. Now for our final and first actual CADIS problem, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Alvin. All right. So yeah, this is a practice problem. We're going to be giving you guys five to 10 minutes, like inside breakout rooms to read the problem and then try and try it out for yourself. Maybe if you think you get it, you can code up a solution. And again, feel free to use any of the code that like we've showed, like for example, BFS or DFS, it may, may or may not be helpful for this problem. Okay, so we're going to go over the solution. Okay, so given some like sample input, let's uh, draw out the info. So we have nine to maybe we have nine to five, which means nine like translations and then five pairs of words. So for each translation, we can we see that the first the first character can be translated into the second. So we have C can be translated to T. I can be translated to R, K can be translated to P, and then O can be translated to C, and then you can keep going until you have built something that looks very similar to something we've learned. This looks really similar to a directed graph where each edge represents letters, uh, what letters can translate to what letter. And generally for any given letter, we can see that it can translate to like some letter by traversing the graph. For example, I can translate to R and R can translate to O, O to C, T to E, and T to F, which means I can be translated to any of these letters in this graph component right here. Okay, so we're going to use an adjacency list to represent our graph. So the, since the input only contains lowercase letters, we can just create a 2D vector of size 26 for each letter. And in this loop right here, we're pushing, we're pushing each, uh, each pairs of letters into the graph. So we take in uh, C1 and C2, and we want to push C2 into C1's adjacency list, which we do by here. Note that our numbers are obtained by getting C1 minus A and C2 minus A. It's because like characters, we want to represent our these characters as integers and we from like zero to 25, and then we can do that by subtracting A. So for example, A minus A would equal zero B minus A would equal one, all the way up to like Z minus A would equal 25. So we can use them inside of our vector and it's more convenient that way. Okay, and now we're gonna take in like each pair of words and we want to see if like the start word can be translated into the end word. And if it can, then we print yes. And if it doesn't, then we print no. And then we do that for each pair of start and end words, which we're gonna do inside this solve function. So now all we need to do is actually create that solve function. So first we check, this is the start of, we're start of our solve function. And first we check if the lengths of the start and ends like words are equal. And if they're not, we can just immediately return no, because since one tra character translates to another character, if the start and ends are of different lengths, then there's already, we already know there's no way we could translate the start to the end if they're different lengths. 
So that's just one easy case. And next we move on to here, we're going to check for every, for i to zero to like the length of star, which is also length of n. So basically we're gonna be checking for every single character. We're gonna check if the ith letter of start can be translated to the ith character of n. And we use a graph traversal to achieve this. And in this example, we end up using DFS. So we create a vector of booleans to check which characters we have visited. And then we run DFS with that vector of booleans and the, the ith character of start. And then we check, have we visited the ith character of the ith character of n? And if we haven't, then the start character isn't like connected, can't translate to the end character. That means the entire start word can't be translated to the end word. So we would turn no. And if we do that for every single character and we get to the end, like after the loop, then it's all letters have been translated and then we can just return yes. And then, so this is, this is general recursion DFS code. So we check for the entire graph, if we can visit A of I, which is what we pass into DFS, then we run DFS at A of I with the same vector Boolean. So for example, if we pass in O, O is adjacent to C, so then we run DFS on C, which is adjacent to T, so we run DFS on T, which is adjacent to E and F. And E is not adjacent to anything and F is not adjacent to anything. And so we, this is the result of our BFS and B now represents all the, all the characters that we can get to from O. And then one more note, uh, remember to pass in B at, like by reference because we are using, we're gonna be using B through multiple functions and we're gonna be modifying it. So what we wanna do is pass, pass in this vector by recur, not recursion, by reference. And now let's uh, put it all together for our solution. First, we're going to initialize our graph, our DFS, and then our solve functions. And then inside main, we construct our graph inside this loop right here. And then solve for each pair of words we, in this loop right here. And then in the solve function, we run through each character of start to see if it, it can be translated to each character of end. And if it can, then we return no. If it can, then we return yes. And then we use DFS to do this. And this is our code for DFS. And so that is how we solve this problem. OK, so if anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns about our general workshop, uh, we have a feedback form that you can fill out. Uh, the link is right here. If someone could put it in the chat for me, that'd be that'd be great. Feedback is helpful and will help us continue improving our workshops for the future. So if you have any feedback, uh, fill it out at the link. We'd really appreciate it. Is it in the chat? No, it's not yet, but I'm pretty sure someone will put it in pretty soon. Yeah, there you go. Thanks for it. Okay, so that's all from us, but of course the workshop isn't over. We have a new contest for you to practice our graph theory problems like uh, our other applications of graph theory and we'll be staying around to help these problems if you choose to stay around. So thank you guys all for coming. <laughs>